Good morning. Isn't this awesome? Got like a full house the first Sunday we do this. Pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. <clears throat> we even had to pull out seats, and so sorry for those in the cheap seats back there. All right. Glad you're here this morning. Let's go ahead and pray. God, thank you for this morning that you've given us. Thank you for your love. Thank you for this opportunity right now to come and to worship you, to lift your name, to glory to God in the highest. And Father, we just pray right now that you would speak through your word, that your word would speak to each and every one of us, that your spirit would indwell this place and help us to see you as who you are, the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this morning everyone was given a name tag, and you should have a name tag on, and that tells who you are. I am Wes, you know, that's my name. It's a name that you are given by your parents, you know, maybe it was a special name that they always wanted to name their child. Maybe it was a name that's been handed down to you from generations, you know, you're a fourth, you're a fifth, whatever, a junior, a senior, you know, you have that special name. Maybe your mom went through a book and she's looking at names of kids, you know, what am I going to name my child, and... You know, she looks at the names, and she looks at the meaning of the names, and she likes the meaning of a name, and so that's how you got your name. My name is actually Wesley, all right, but don't call me that, all right? <laughs> that's reserved for my mom, all right? And so my name is Wesley, which means West Meadow. I don't know. It's just kind of, I'm a West Meadow, whatever that is, you know? But Heidi, I looked up her name. She is noble or honorable. I looked up Jeremy's name, and his name means God will uplift, which I thought was pretty cool for a worship leader, that God will uplift. And so today we're starting this series, and we're going to be looking at different names of God as we lead up to Christmas and on Christmas Eve. Names are important to us, but names are also important to God. That's why he said in the Ten Commandments, he said, Thou shalt not take my name in vain. Why? Because his name is holy, and it means something. Now, the name that we typically think of when we think of the name of God in the Bible is the name Jehovah. Jehovah is the one we typically go to, which in Hebrew is Yahweh. But God has a lot of names beyond Jehovah. He has names that actually describe his character, describe his attributes. And here's the thing. Every single name is important to God. So in this Christmas series, we're going to look at several names, and what we want to do is we want to celebrate the way that God revealed himself to us in the person of Jesus Christ. But the picture we often get at Christmas time is of a baby in a manger. You know, we, we think that maybe this is the first time that God introduced himself to us, but here's the thing, God has been introducing himself to us since the beginning. All throughout the Bible, he introduces himself to us, and it culminates in the birth of Jesus, where he is not only introduced to us, but he comes to be with us. So if you have your Bibles this morning, turn to John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1. And what we're going to see, if you look at the different Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you're going to see that the different Gospel writers, they introduce Jesus in different ways, they take different views of his life so that we get a well-rounded look at who Jesus is. Now, we're most familiar with the Gospel of Luke at Christmas time because at Christmas, you know, we go to the Gospel of Luke, and in the Gospel of Luke, he talks about the birth of Jesus, you know, we've got, you know, we've got the the no room in the inn, we've got the manger, and we have the birth of Jesus there in the Gospel of Luke. But the Gospel of John, John takes a different approach because John wants to emphasize the deity of Jesus Christ. He wants to make it clear that this baby is the Lord of Lords and he is the King of Kings. That this baby that we are celebrating at Christmas time is God in the flesh. And so Luke focuses on Jesus at the moment he comes into the world. John introduces Jesus to us before the world even began. So John chapter 1, look at verses 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning was the Word. Now we're going to see here in a moment that Word, Word, actually is Jesus. 
It's a reference to Jesus. So in the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word already existed. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Nothing was created except through Jesus. And so John calls Jesus the Word, and he says the Word has always been. It has always been there. The Word was with God in the beginning. Everything was created through Jesus. And that word, Word, in the Greek is logos. Logos, and it's an ex- it means a, a declaration or expression of thought. All right. So when John refers to Jesus, John is saying, Logos. Jesus is the expression of God in the flesh. He is God in the flesh. Logos. And so he wants to make it clear that as we remember the birth of Christ, that Jesus was not just a representation of God. Jesus was, in fact, the manifestation of God. You see, there's a difference. Jesus is God in human form. Jesus is God with skin on. Jesus wasn't just an expression. He was God. He was God in the flesh. And so for us, oftentimes, when we look at the Christmas story, we think in terms of the nativity. We think of the manger, the baby in the manger, and we look at it from a very human perspective of who Jesus is. But John makes it very clear that this baby in the manger is, well, it's God. One of my favorite names, the one I really want to focus on today for God in the Bible, is the name El Elyon. El Elyon. And what it means is simply this, the God Most High. El Elyon, the God Most High. Now it's used over 230 times in the Old Testament, and it is meant to communicate the, the majesty, the greatness of God. That there is no one higher There is no one greater. There is no one like our God. He is the greatest of the great. He is the mightiest of the mighty. He is the wisest of the wise. He is the strongest of the strong. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the end. That's who Jesus is. And so don't miss that this Christmas. Don't miss that this baby that we celebrate is the God most high and there is no one like him. Back in 1979, um, several families from my church up in northeast Ohio, we got together to watch the Super Bowl. Now that year, the Super Bowl featured the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Dallas Cowboys. So I was born outside of Pittsburgh, right outside of Pittsburgh, so I came out of my mother's womb in a Pittsburgh Steeler uniform. And so (laughs) it was kind of painful for her, but I, I made it out. But... You know, so I've been a Steelers fan since birth. And so in 1979, they are in their fourth Super Bowl in the 70s. They won the first three that they were in. So we gather together in this house. It's a great game between the Steelers and the Cowboys. It's in the fourth quarter. Three minutes left in the game. The score is Pittsburgh, 35, the Dallas Cowboys, 17. We're excited. We're thinking, man, Pittsburgh's got this game in the bag. This game is over. But all of a sudden, Dallas scores a touchdown pretty quick. Then they score another touchdown. Now with 26 seconds left in the game, the score is 35-31. Dallas, we know, with 26 seconds left, what are they going to do? They're going to try an onside kick. So we're all sitting on the edge of our seats, waiting in anticipation. What's going to happen with an onside kick? They make the kick. Rocky Blyer of the Pittsburgh Steelers smothers the ball. And we just went ecstatic. Because we know Pittsburgh's got possession now. Terry Bradshaw's going to take a knee. Game over. Pittsburgh Steelers, four-time Super Bowl champions. This is it. And so we're going crazy. We're high-fiving. You know, we're just screaming and hollering. All except one annoying woman. (laughs) She slept through the whole entire fourth quarter. I mean, this is greatness in the making, and she is sleeping. This is history right here. The Pittsburgh Steelers, four-time Super Bowl, and she's sleeping. Not only that, she has this thing where she snores occasionally. And so, you know, every now and then you hear this, you know. And as an 11-year-old boy, I walked over to this woman, and I grabbed her by the shoulders, and I said, 
Mom! Mom! Wake up! It's time to celebrate. The Steelers have won. This Christmas, <laughs> sorry, this Christmas season, this is my prayer that the Holy Spirit would come into this place as we gather together as one body in one service, and He would grab you and He would grab me because I know I need it by the shoulders, and he would shake me. And he would say, Wes, don't miss this. This is significant. I know you sang the carols for years. I know you've heard the Christmas story over and over again. But don't miss this. This is significant. This is the Lord Most High that you are celebrating. This is God coming to earth in bodily form for you. And so here's what we find as we look at this name, El Elyon. As we look at it in the Old Testament, I want to look at just a couple places where he's mentioned in scriptures as El Elyon to kind of paint the picture. One place where this name is used for God is in Daniel chapter 2, verses 20 through 22. It says, Praise be to the name of God, El Elyon, forever and ever. Wisdom and power are his. He changes times and seasons. He disposes kings and raises up others. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the discerning. He revels deep in hidden things. He knows what lies in darkness and light dwells within him. El El Yon. Here's another place that, that this name is used by Isaiah, but this is God speaking of himself. Isaiah 46 verses 9 through 10 Remember the things I've done in the past. For I alone am El Elyon. I alone am God. I alone am God. I am God and there is none like me. Only I can tell the future before it even happens. Everything I plan will come to pass. For I do whatever I wish. And so this is the name, that the Lord Most High. In Isaiah chapter 40, he uses some different images to help us understand the God most high, the greatness of God. And one of those images that he uses is by giving us some measurements so we can try to wrap our minds around this. We, we can't totally comprehend the greatness of God. We just, we just don't get it. And so he gives us this metaphoric language to try to help us understand. And here's what he says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 12. He asks this question. He says, who has measured... The waters in the hollow of his hands. Okay, so Wednesday night at prayer group, I, I had us do a little experiment just to see. I had them put tablespoons of water in the hollow of my hands. I can hold right about five tablespoons before it starts to overflow. And Isaiah says, who can measure the waters in the hollow of his hands? Think about how incredible that is. We know that the earth is covered by about 71% water. Some places it's as much as six miles deep. And so you put a tablespoon of water in God's hands, there's Lake Erie. You put a tablespoon, another tablespoon, the Atlantic Ocean. You put another tablespoon, the Pacific Ocean. And Isaiah says that's how great, that's how magnificent God is. That's how big he is. He is the Lord Most High. He goes on with another question. He says this, Who has with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? So, the breadth of my hand from tip of my thumb to the tip of my pinky is about nine inches. Okay? I can barely palm a basketball. <laughs> and yet, we know that the, the closest star, other than the sun, is four and a half light years away. That's 26 trillion miles. And God says, Oh, yeah, I got that. That's how big he is. That's how magnificent he is. And so he gives us these images to help us understand how great our God is. So how do we respond at Christmas time? To the Lord Most High. Well, David writes about this quite often. As a matter of fact, if you want to see El El Yon used the most, go to the Psalms. That's where you see it the most frequently. I want to read a couple. It's usually connected to worship. 
Here's a couple examples. Psalm 7, verse 17. He says, I will give thanks to the Lord according to his righteousness. I will sing praises of the name of El El Yon, the Lord Most High. Psalm 9, 2. I will be filled with joy because of you. I will sing praises to your name, El El Yon, the Lord Most High. And so what we see is the greatness and majesty of God and our response when we see this and understand it is heartfelt worship. Not just singing Christmas carols, but heartfelt worship. And so here's the Christmas challenge. I'm going to give you two challenges for Christmas. Number one is this, that we are going to respond with worship. We're going to respond with worship. We're going to respond to the greatness of God by worshiping him and being filled with joy because God is in control. So when you feel like your life is out of control, when you feel like things are you know, going downhill, when you feel like you're falling apart, would you fix your eyes on El El Yon, the Lord Most High, his strength and his power? But when Jesus was born, here's the thing, there wasn't a recognition like that. It was pretty much silent. It was a silent night. I mean, people didn't realize what was going on. I mean, his birth pretty much went unnoticed. People were distracted. People were busy. People were apathetic. People were ignorant. They didn't realize that this baby that was born in Bethlehem was the Lord Most High. But there was one segment that seemed to take notice of this, and that would have been the angels, because in Luke chapter 2, we read about this heavenly host, this, this army of angels that gathers together and does glory to God in the highest, and peace on earth whom, with whom God is pleased, on whom his favor rests, as a lot of translations read. So that's Jesus, Jesus the Lord Most High. So don't miss how incredible this is. I mean, it's extraordinary that God the Most High becomes a man, but what's even more incredible is how he comes. He doesn't come as a prince. He doesn't come as a king. He's not born in a palace. He's born in a barn. He's not wrapped in fine linens. He's wrapped in rags. His first night is not in a comfortable crib bed. It's in a feeding trough. He, he became the lowest. The highest became the lowest, and that's what makes Christmas so incredible, is that we have the Lord Most High who makes himself nothing. Now just compare for a moment what was happening right up the street from where Jesus is born, because Mary and Joseph might have been able to see this. Three miles up the road is Herod, King Herod's palace. It sat up on a hill. It was 90 feet tall. It sat on 45 acres of land. It was surrounded by 200 acres of property, probably included swimming pools and exotic gardens. That's where King Herod lived. And yet three miles down the road in Bethlehem, here's the king of kings, born in a stable, lying in a feeding trough. So why? Why? Well, there's a Christmas challenge in this for us. That because Jesus went from the highest to lowest, it's not just him declaring his love for us, it is an invitation for us to follow his example. Now Paul talks about this in Philippians chapter 2, and it might be kind of a strange Christmas passage, but it works. It works. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul gives us the Christmas challenge. Philippians 2, 5, he says this, Look, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And so here's challenge number two. To have the attitude, the same attitude as Christ. To have that same attitude. And then he uses the birth of Christ as an illustration to get the attitude that we should have. Philippians 2, 5-7, through seven, he says this. Have the same attitude as Christ, who being in the very nature God, in the very nature El El Yon, that's who he is. He is the King of Kings, he is the Lord of Lords, but he releases those rights, okay, made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, and was made in human likeness. And so here you have the God Most High who makes himself nothing, and then there's this invitation for us to have that same attitude, to follow that same example. The one who had everything makes himself nothing. The one who deserved a royal welcome is 
is content with a humble hello. The one who had the world at his feet came to wash the feet of the world. And that is the challenge of Christmas, to reflect that attitude and that same spirit in our lives. And so in Philippians 2, 3, Paul kind of fleshes that out a little bit, and he helps us understand. Because here's what we say. We say, okay, okay, I get it. You know, have the same attitude as Christ. Good Christmas challenge, Wes. Good Christmas challenge. I like it. But when we go from general to specific, that's when we start to squirm a little bit. That's when we start to get a little bit uncomfortable, but that's what Paul's going to do to us. In Philippians 2, 3, here's what Paul says. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Now, here's what I've learned. Over the years, that everything I've done, most everything I've done has probably been pretty much out of selfish ambition. That I do it for myself. That there's selfish motives behind just about everything I do. Now, I may say, well, I'm doing this, you know, I'm trying to be unselfish here, but I want someone to notice that I'm being unselfish. Or I wanted to be rewarded for my unselfishness, right? You know, so I realize God shows me that just about everything I do is done for selfish ambitions, and yet Paul says, no, no, that's not how you do it. Do nothing out of selfish ambition, do nothing out of pride, do nothing out of vain conceit, but here's the path we choose instead. In humility, we are going to value others. In humility, we are going to consider others greater, better than ourselves. Okay, well, I can do that. I can consider other people who are important more important than me. That's not what it says. It doesn't say consider other people who are more important more important than you. It says consider others better than yourselves. Why? Because we are all sons and daughters of God, and so you treat them as if they are a son and daughter of God. Each of you should not look to your own interest but to the interest of others. Is that how it works for you around the holiday season? Is that how it works for you in your homes? Is that what it looks like? Because, I mean, everybody's, you know, going, no, 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 you go first. No, no, you go first. No, I insist, you go first. Because typically what happens is, you know, we put the Christmas presents underneath the tree, And if you have young kids in your home, they do the present count. Don't think they don't. And one of the siblings has two more presents than they do, and somebody needs to make this right. I mean, they got nine, I got seven. Something's not right here. Someone needs to make this right. Or there's a present that's of significant size, and it doesn't have your name on it. And you're thinking, well, surely mom and dad, (laughs) they must have another present stashed away somewhere. It's hidden. It didn't fit under the tree because I have to be getting the largest present, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. There's no other explanation. That tends to be the way we approach it. Now, as adults, we don't do a whole lot better. We just disguise it better. We learn to hide it a little bit more. But oftentimes, this is the spirit. You may have told your spouse, look, honey, you don't need to get me anything for Christmas this year, but surely she understands that's just a figure of speech. (laughs) Surely she knows that's not literal. You know, it's just a gesture. And so let me help you with this. If you are a newlywed sitting here this morning, and I know at least one couple in here is, you may say, you know what, we, you know, we're a little tight this year, trying to get on our feet. You know what, let's, let's just not get anything for each other for Christmas this year. That's not what they mean. <laughs> that, that, that's, not, that's not, because you don't need to get me anything. That's what they say. But if you don't get me anything, I am going to remind you of that for the rest of your life. And ten years from now, I'm going to tell the story of our first Christmas when you got me nothing. Okay, and so, I mean, that tends to be the way we feel. And if your spouse says, hey, let's just buy for the kids, you, you know, we don't need to exchange gifts this year. What that means is, hey, I'm not getting you anything, but may God deal with you ever so severely if there's not a present for me underneath that tree. There's just a side of us that is constantly looking for ourselves, for our own needs, to feel entitled. Now, a lot of us would say, okay, okay, you know, if everyone in my home, if everyone in my community, if everyone says that I'm going to consider others better than myself, this could really work. 
as long as other people will do it. You know, as long as my spouse says, you know, I will consider you better than me, then I'll consider her better than me. As long as this will work in our home, if everyone has this attitude that I'll consider you better than me, that'll work great. But, but what if other people, what if, what if I consider other people better than me and they don't, they don't consider me better than them? Well, that's what Jesus did, right? He puts others ahead of himself. Not because we've earned it, not because we deserve it, but because he loved us and his heart was for us. Because we think, well, if I don't look out for me, then who's going to look out for me? I mean, if I don't get a piece of the pie, then I might end up with an empty plate. If I don't call front seat, then my sister's always going to get the front seat. If I don't get control, the remote control, then I'm going to end up watching Dancing with the Stars. You know, I... If I don't look out for my own needs, then who's going to do that? But you see, this is how we reflect Christmas. We have that kind of spirit, a humble servanthood, where we consider others better than ourselves. And so here's the cool thing. Over the course of the next few weeks, even just today, you are going to have opportunities to live out the Christmas story. By having the same attitude of Christ, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant. You will have that opportunity. It might be with someone in your neighborhood where you are going to have a chance to reflect the Christmas story to a neighbor of yours. It might be at the restaurant this afternoon if you go out to eat and the waitress is lousy, she's slow, and instead of getting mad, you're going to take on the attitude of Christ and you're going to reflect the Christmas story. It might be with someone in your home, in your family, or a friend, and you're waiting for them to come and make amends with you. Maybe it's time for you to reflect the Christmas story, the attitude of Christ, and go and make amends with them. And Paul says, look, this is how Jesus lived. That's how we're called to live. He made himself nothing. He took on the very nature of a servant. And then he continues in Philippians 2, 8 through 11. This didn't stop at the manger. Listen to this. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so here's Jesus hanging on the cross. His hands are nailed to the cross. Now just think about this. What's he doing? He's putting others ahead of himself. Just think about that. His hands are nailed to the cross, and who's he concerned about? His mother. His hands are nailed to the cross, and what's he doing? He's praying for the forgiveness of the people who crucified him. His hands are nailed to the cross, and he's reaching out to the thief that is hanging next to him. He was obedient even to death, death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the God the Father. A name that is above every name. El Elyon. The Lord Most High. So here's the challenge this Christmas. We're not just going to celebrate it. We're going to live it. And so number one, we are going to worship genuinely. We're going to respond to the Lord Most High with genuine worship. And we're going to do that here in a moment through the rest of our service. I'm going to pray. We're going to sing. We're going to have communion. We're going to have offering. All those things are an act of worship. They're all an act of worship. But it doesn't stop here. Because then you take that that worship and you take it out into the community where you go, and you live it. And number two, number two, we're going to live out the Christmas story through humble service. That, that we're going to find a way in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our church, to consider others better than ourselves. To put others' needs ahead of our own. And in doing so, we will be celebrating the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. El El Yon, the Lord Most High. Let's pray. 
Jesus, would you just impress upon us the significance of even the moment right here? That right now we are talking to you, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, the God most high. That there is no one like you. There has never been anyone like you. That you existed before time began. That everything was created through you. And so this morning we come to celebrate you. We come to celebrate your greatness. We come to celebrate that you are the Lord most high. We come to celebrate that you were there in the beginning. Thank you, God. We come to celebrate that you, even on the cross, humbled yourself, became obedient, obedient to death, death on a cross. That on the cross, you covered our sins. On the cross, you forgave us. On the cross, you gave us a great gift of eternal life. And so, Father, we thank you. We thank you for that gift. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for being El Elyon. We pray these things in your most holy name. Amen.